let's begin our session with uh, Umm Al-Kitab Al-Fatihah. Okay, um, so have I got any session with your group before? No, this is the first time. This is the first session. This is the only session that I have uh, with your group. With your group. So this is two groups, isn't it? Uh -uh. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, Okay, what we'll do today is uh, we'll do uh, some discussion about um, about how to approach some, some issues in, uh, in pediatrics. Okay, all right. So uh, I, I assume you've, you've had several sessions on um, case-based discussion, isn't it? With Dr. Taufik, Dr. Mossad and others, isn't it? So in, in, those, in those sessions, I assume uh, some of you have done some uh, case presentation and some of you have done some uh, uh, clucking, isn't it? Where you clack cases. Okay. Uh, what we'll do today is basically just just, uh, just few basics of basics of things. Okay. Um, when you clock patient, when you clock patient, uh, when you get history from patient, when you examine patient, and then you'll be presenting the case either to uh, other doctors, to your seniors, or in your case, to your examiner, to your lecturer. What is the purpose? What, what are the objectives of clocking? What are the objectives of presenting a case? Anyone can suggest? Any idea? What is the objective of doing this? Clocking, physical examination, case presentation. What is the objective? Anyone? To know what is the patient's problem. Okay, okay. Lagi, lain? Any, um, any to familiarize, uh, familiarize ourselves with the presentation of the disease. Okay, all right. Lagi? Uh, to get a full picture of the patient's complaint. Okay, all right. Lagi, lain? To include or exclude any differential diagnosis okay. the patient's problem. Okay, good. Okay, all right. So basically what we are trying to do is we are trying to prepare you to become good doctors. And good doctors, when we, when we see patients, when we see cases, there are four objectives. Whenever we clock patient, whenever we examine, whenever we present cases, there are four objectives. The first one is basically to get to your provisional diagnosis to focus, to zoom in, to sell your provisional diagnosis. Why? Because we treat patient, we manage the case based on our provisional diagnosis. The treatment, treatment regimes, all will depend on what is the provisional diagnosis. So how we go, what is the prognosis and everything will depend on the provisional diagnosis. What is the most likely, what are we treating the patient as? Huh? So that's the first objective, to get to your provisional diagnosis. Because without provisional diagnosis, how can we manage? We manage case based on the provisional diagnosis. So your history should cover everything about the provisional diagnosis. What are the causes? What are the natural history? What are the presentation? What are the... You need to get everything about the... Provisional diagnosis. If your provisional diagnosis is asthma, for example, if your provisional diagnosis is asthma, okay, asthma 
it's not just a simple diagnosis. You need to be thorough. You need to be complete. Meaning, if does the patient come in exacerbation? If the patient comes in an exacerbation, so patient can come with because of so many things. The patient can come with uh, with an exacerbation, tachypnea, wheezing, so on and so forth. Or the patient can come just for follow up. So asymptomatic currently. The patient can come for exam. The patient can come for so many things. And so if the patient comes to you with an exacerbation, so you need to then stratify, you need to then classify the severity of the exacerbation. And so uh, how do we classify severity of exacerbation? How do we classify severity of asthma exacerbation? By asking the symptom of the patient, the day symptom, the night symptom, or the the what, the frequency of it in the month. That's that's not right, lah. Eh? So basically, go and read uh, pediatric protocol from Malaysian Hospital fourth edition. In color purple, though, at least that's the minimum uh, uh, reading. After that, you can read uh, Malaysian uh, clinical practice guideline. CPG for childhood asthma. Uh, I think this year they'll 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 uh, publish uh, an updated version. Or better still, if you can read the GINA guideline. Okay, so asthma exacerbation severity, severity of acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma. You classify according to mild, moderate, severe, life threatening. Mild, moderate, severe, life threatening. There are there are several parameters that you look for. You look at SpO2. You look at the ability for the patient to speak. You look at the uh, uh, PEFR. You look at the heart rate. You look at the uh, pulse. You look at the conscious level. So there are made several parameters for you to assess whether the patient is mild, moderate, severe, or life-threatening acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma. So professional diagnosis of asthma, you need to be you need to be thorough and complete. So Come in exacerbation, you classify the severity of the exacerbation. Is that enough? That's not enough because exacerbation, there is a reason for the exacerbation. There is a trigger for the exacerbation. What are examples of the triggers? Dust, cold drinks, cold weather, certain fruits, certain, certain type of diet, infection, URTI, pharyngitis, pneumonia, all these are triggers for the exacerbation. So, mild, moderate, severe, life-threatening, acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma, secondary to cold weather, secondary to dust, secondary to pneumonia, secondary to upper respiratory infection, secondary to pharyngitis, secondary to whatever, whatever. what is the trigger for the exacerbation. So your history must be thorough enough for you to get what is actually the, what is the trigger. Man, you need to go through all the triggers. Is there any cats in the house? Is there any carpets in the house? What is the trigger? Do, do they live near uh, 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 construction ke? Uh, any new construction now? So your history must be very thorough. Ramai orang datang rumah, the house is full with people now. Man. So what is the trigger? Okay, is that enough? That is still not enough. Because again, asthma is a, should be a complete diagnosis. There is another component of the provisional diagnosis if, if it's asthma. So the other component is the status of the asthma. How do you classify the status of the asthma? So there are two. If the asthma is a newly diagnosed asthma, Sebelum ni tak ada pernah doktor mana-mana diagnose asthma. Kan? Tapi dah pernah nap few times. Tapi no, no one ever diagnose asthma. So you classify according to intermittent or persistent. So intermittent or persistent. Persistent pula ada mild, moderate, severe. Persistent bronchial asthma. This is for newly diagnosed bronchial asthma. If the asthma is already on treatment, already on controller medication, then you classify according to control. So well controlled, partly controlled, or 
poorly controlled. So, yeah. so an asthma diagnosis, it should be mild, moderate, severe, life-threatening, acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma, secondary to pharyngitis, secondary to what is the trigger for the exacerbation, with underlying control asthma or intermittent persistent asthma. Okay, all right. So all this you need to know. So you need to get the history. How was the frequency of the exacerbation? Frequency of nocturnal symptoms. Frequency of daytime symptoms. Frequency of exercise induced exacerbation. Any change of house. Any pets. Any car pets. Rumah dia near tembok ke apa ke. So what is it? The what are the other parameters that affects? And any smoker in the house. Yeah. Uh, so that's the, because this is how we're going to manage. If intermittent asthma, different management. If persistent asthma, different management. If it's well controlled, partly controlled, poorly controlled, management will be different as well. Severity of exacerbation will differ as well. So treatment will will differ so that is why you need to get a good grasp of the provisional diagnosis because having a good provisional diagnosis will actually help you to manage the patient so a good presentation need to cover detail about the provisional diagnosis and without knowing the provisional diagnosis you won't know what are the questions to ask kan you nak tanya macam mana? Macam mana you nak tanya pasal nocturnal symptom, daytime symptom kalau you pun tak tahu? Kan? If you are shooting blank, you just tanya ah, sakit apa? Ha. So, you are shooting blanks. Yes, open-ended question is important but it is good to, it is important as well for you to mix between open-ended and a close targeted question. Yeah? Or, or an open targeted question rather than just a full open question. Okay, so that is the first objective, to get to your provisional diagnosis. What is the second objective? Second objective is to rule out your differential diagnosis. Rule out differential diagnosis. So your history, your physical examination, and your presentation, your summary later on, it should cover at least five differential diagnosis. For third year, at least five. For fifth year, I expect at least seven. Differential diagnosis. Differential diagnosis maknanya, okay, if you are think, if your provisional is asthma, what are the differential diagnosis? Could it be pneumonia? Could it be partially treated pneumonia? Could it be pneumonitis? Could it be croup? Could it be pharyngitis? Could it be uh, plural effusion, could it be uh, empyema, could it be pneumothorax, what are your provision, what are your differential diagnosis, you need to have at least five differential diagnosis, your history must rule out what are the positives and what are the negatives of each differential diagnosis, because why, because sometimes we may miss things, the first doctor who clerk the patient, maybe too focus on one diagnosis, but you don't, they don't think of any other differential. But actually the patient had a different diagnosis. So that is why we need to always think what are the differential diagnosis. I'll give you one example. Uh, I've had one student before. You know, in, 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 in HTA, we don't have that many patients with bronchiectasis in children. We don't have that many. We have, we have a few. We don't have that many. So there, there was one student, I think it was a few years back, so she already had this patient with bronchiectasis for uh, during her block. She has already presented uh, the case. She has already discussed about the case. So then she got this 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 same case masa block exam. Masa block exam, she got the same case that she had presented before. So what happened was she, because she already knew the diagnosis. She know the diagnosis. She knew the diagnosis already. And so she assumed, so at that particular time, she did not think of other differential diagnosis. So they tahu dah diagnosis dia macam tu. Budak tu has been having this disease for many, many years. So they tahu dah disease tu. So she's too focused on that provisional diagnosis. On this one diagnosis. 
she forgot about other differential diagnosis. So her history was very narrow, very focused, too focused on one diagnosis without thinking about any other differential diagnosis. Then, so what do you expect? So dia pun tak kelak detail. Parents pun, oh, I've spoken to this, child, this, this, this doctor, I've, I've told the history already. So mother pun tak cerita detail dah. So what do you expect is going to happen to her presentation? Obviously, it's going to be bad lah. Because as doctors, we always need to think about what are the differential diagnosis. Because sometimes the initial diagnosis may be wrong or maybe not entirely correct. Because each time you clap, you may get more information. For example, when you clap the patient, when you clap the mother for the first time, there, there may be some information that the mother may have forgotten or may got confused, for example. Kan? Lepas tu, lepas you tanya tu, lepas you keluar, mother pun fikir, oh, actually doktor ni tanya benda ni, oh, probably I miss something. Oh, probably I misunderstood the question. Kan? So the next doctor yang kelak, the mother may give a different or updated version of the history. So that is common. Kan? And sometimes when you clock the patient after five days, for example, parents already know, dah susun dah apa nak cakap. Dia dah tahu dah apa nak cakap. Sebab so many people have asked the same question. So you may get more information. So that is why we need to always think about differential diagnosis. So provisional diagnosis, differential diagnosis. So the first objective of presenting a case, the first objective of case clocking, case uh, presentation, examination, is to get to your provisional diagnosis because that is how you're going to manage. The second is actually to rule out differential diagnosis. So you need to make sure that you cover at least five differential diagnoses. Okay, clear. What is the third objective? The third objective is to look at complications of the disease. Because all the disease that you have mentioned, provisional and differential, all this has its own complications. So you need to think, what are the complications that has happened? Then, and because everything in this world has its own complication. Nothing in this world that tak ada complication. Everything ada complication. Asthma, ada complication there. Then, so what are the complications that has happened? So think about what are the complications. And in your history, in your physical examination, you need to look for those complications. Now, this is the job of a doctor because we are treating patient. We do not just treat one disease. We treat the patient as a whole because the patient is a human being. Okay, clear. So that is the third objective. What is the fourth? objective of any presentation. The fourth objective is to look for complications of treatment. Because whatever we do, whatever treatment that we do or any other people do has its own complication. Not doing anything pun ada complication. Not initiating treatment pun ada complication. And those complications, you as doctor, you need to go through them. You need to assess whether there's any complication. You need to assess whether do you need to do something or not with the complication. So look for those complications. Minum air kosong pun ada complication. Nothing in this world tak ada complication. Nothing. Bernafas ada complication. Kan? Kalau ada COVID dalam air, airborne ni apa benda kan? That, 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 everything in this world ada complication. Nothing in this world tak ada complication. Yeah, so you need to look for any complication that may have happened. For example, if the patient presented with five days history before you clock, before before admission, before admission, five days history of fever. Do you think a parent will just leave the child be with fever for five days without doing anything? Very unlikely, isn't it? The parents will have done something. And that something must have some complication. It has complication, but whether the complication has happened or not, yang tu, you nak kena, you nak kena check. The parents may have given paracetamol. Paracetamol has complication. It is hepatotoxic, isn't it? The parents may, may give uh, a, a parental NSAID. Boron, subboron, kan? 
and you know in in certain cases for example h1n1 h1n1 influenza if you give sub nc there's a risk for uh, edem uh, uh, encephalomyelitis uh, those are complications that may have happened then yeah. if 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 the patient is is uh, is asthmatic for example before admission probably dah pergi nap during admission masa dekat ED tu berapa hours they spend dekat ED that is why history bila you clock history it is important bila, sebelum admit tu berapa lama they spend dekat ED kalau they struggle in ED pasang line cucuk sampai dekat apa semua kan probably there's so much the the child presented in a more severe situation sampai masuk dekat ED tu tiga line pasang so that must be complicated in case kalau satu line atau doktor ED tak pasang line pun So probably that's a simple case lah, tak perlu line pun. Tapi kalau kat ED sampai tiga line. So it suggests only that the patient arrive in a very severe condition. Kan? And those benda ada ada dia punya complication dia. Dia bagi nap ke, dia bagi fluid, dia bagi apa. Those have complication. If you clock the patient five days after admission, three three days after admission, one week after admission, two weeks after admission, Those two weeks in the ward, people must have done something in the ward. Takkanlah masuk ward tu orang tak buat apa-apa. Kan? People must have done something in the ward. And those something that the that medical people does to any patient has its own complication. Nebulization has complication. First, you need to know lah nebulization with what. Adakah dia bagi nap sabutamol ke bronchodilator ke? Ataupun dia bagi nap atropine ke? ataupun dia bagi nap saline ke ataupun dia bagi nap antibiotic ke you need to know what type of what type of nebulization dia bagi kan kalau dia bagi nap sabutamol for example beta agonist uh, bronchodilator sabutamol has complication betul tak anyone knows what are the complications of sabutamol salbutamol siapa boleh bagi idea Siapa ya? Yang tak ada gambar ni. Akmal Hisham. One complication of sabutamol. Hello? Ha, ah, yes. Hmm. Ah? Palpitation. Palpitation. Yes. Suhaib. Lagi apa lagi? Suhaib Abdul. Uh, dry mouth. Ha? Huh? Dry mouth. Dry mouth, more of atrovan, ipratropium rather than uh, sabutamol. One ashraf, kita ambil yang tak ada gambar dulu. Eh. Headache. Eh, dah, dah, dah. Dah saya ke? Tak ni? Haa, ah, boleh, boleh. Haa, ah. ah, okay. One ashraf. Kenapa tadi? Ya, tak dengar. Hey. Oh, headache. Headache. Sabu tamal, headache. Boleh lah, headache ni macam-macam benda boleh cause by cause by cause headache. And dengar your presentation ni sometimes jadi headache juga. Okay, alright. Uh, Umi Ifa. Um, coughing. Coughing. Complication of sabu tamal. Uh. Not really lah. It, it may help you to expectorate but it doesn't actually cause a coughing. Okay. Alright. So, sabotamol can cause so many things. Arrhythmia, tachycardia, palpitation, tremors, hypokalemia, eh, low potassium for example. Because sabotamol pushes potassium. You remember potassium is an intracellular solute. Sodium is an intravascular solute extracellular sodium duduk di luar sel duduk dalam blood but so, potassium is an intracellular solute most potassium in our body actually stays inside the cell tak banyak dalam plasma so bila you ada hyperkalemia for example you give sabutamol sabutamol pushes potassium from intravascular into the intracellular so that is what sabutamol does So sometimes if you give many many uh, sabutamol kan you may have hypokalemia and hypokalemia ada complications dia 
among the complications are among the things that you can see are ECG. There may be some ECG changes. I'm not going to talk about that. I hope you already know lah. What are the ECG changes when you have potassium abnormalities? Hypokalemia or hyperkalemia. And the other are the ECG changes. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> these are the four objectives of case plucking, four objectives of case examination, four objectives of case presentation. So this is applicable to all postings. It's not just pediatric. This is applicable to all postings. Termasuk lah, mana-mana posting lah. So, you need to cover all four objectives. It should get to your provisional diagnosis. It should rule out differential diagnosis, at least five differential diagnosis. It should look at complications of the disease. It should look at complications of the treatment. Yeah? So, this is applicable to all posting. Pediatric, adult, surgical, ortho, psychiatry, anything. Anything, public health, semua. Kan? These are the four objectives. Okay? So, when you can, I, I can tell you, you can only ask appropriate questions when you know the diagnosis. So, having good diagnosis is very, very important. Having good diagnosis is very important. You can only do appropriate physical examination if you know what are your diagnosis. Okay. The other thing I want to remind you is that summary. Summary is very, very important. I, I, for my experience so far, medical student ignore summary. You buat summary ni macam benda-benda simple je. I can tell you for sure, summary is among the most important aspect of your presentation. Because when you summarize well, satu ni kita ni human. Human being eh. We are selective listener. We only listen to things that we want to listen. We only hear things that we have an idea of. Kita dah ada some idea, kita dengar yang tu je. We are selective listener. No one listens to you 100%. No one, not even your mother, not even your uh, spouse, not even anyone. Uh, no one listens to you 100%. No human being listens to you 100%. No, we are selective listener. We only listen to things that we want to listen. Kan? So we may miss things. Kan? Sometimes kalau in exam, for example, you are the chief uh, student for the day, semua orang pun dah exhausted. Kan? Obviously, we won't listen to you 100%. Kan? But having a good summary tells us that you actually know the patient. Tells us that you actually know the disease. And you actually know how to actually sell your provisional diagnosis. So having good summary is of utmost importance. If there is one thing that you want to write before you present, that will be summary. So having good summary is very important. Okay, all right. Saying that, uh, saying that one thing is your group, you are having the new curriculum. You don't have the typical long case and short case presentation, kan? Well, you have long case. You have long case, but you don't have the short case. You have the uh, uh, man oski. So man oski, you have the man oski, but you still have long case. Kan? You still have long case. Or I, I don't know what's going to happen. Lah. Uh, your clinical exam will be uh, much, much later, kan? Lepas you habis all four punya posting and then you'll do face-to-face uh, -face and then you'll have your clinical exam. So I, 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 I seriously don't know what's going to happen. Uh, but if, if you are going to do like what we are doing for the previous third years and for the uh, current fifth year, we, we are having the men, uh, we are having the modified long case. So modified long case is where you uh, clap patients in front of the examiner and then you examine patient in front of the examiner. So it's a bit of both long case and short case as well. Sometimes you don't have uh, appropriate time for, for summary. That is why I tell you it is very good for you to practice doing summary. 
because even though you are you are clucking the patient in front of the examiner you still need to summarize what what you've got you still need to summarize what you have got sama juga dengan man or skin kan you have examined you still need to summarize your examination you still need to summarize what is your findings so preparing a good summary is a very good practice so when you give a good summary it tells us that you actually know the patient you actually know the disease if your summary is haru biru it tells us that you are just seem like a typewriter you just record everything and then you don't know which is important uh, so good summary is very important so if any part of your history physical examination one thing which is i think you need to plan and write is actually the the summary okay all right any any question so far any question any question okay uh Okay, uh, we'll do another, 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 another discussion. What, which one would you prefer? You do you want to discuss about uh, nephrotic, nephritic, or do you want to discuss about respiratory examination? Cepat, mana satu? One day, we only have time for one. Nephrotic and nephritic seems great. Yes, nephrotic and nephritic. Yeah. Okay. Boleh. Fine. Kalau tak, you boleh, you, be, you boleh. Kalau tak, you remind me lah nanti bila masa face to face nanti. We'll discuss about examination. Yeah, maksudnya you still have time masa tu lah. Yeah. Will uh, nanti bila masuk face to face uh, remind me. We'll discuss about uh, understanding the understanding the basics of respiratory findings. Understanding the base, we can even do understanding the basics of uh, cardiovascular findings as well. Okay, <coughs> all right. So with me, I always I always like to emphasize to student. Um, okay, it is good. If you memorize things, if you memorize asthma, it's okay. But it is better if you understand the basics of it, if you understand the pathophysiology of it. Uh, because when you understand, you will not get confused easily. You will not get confused easily. Um, sama juga dengan nephrotic and nephritic syndrome. People may just hapal, uh, memorize things. That's fine. If your memory is like gel, that's fine. It's okay. But if you're like me, sometimes it's better for you to understand it. Because when you understand it, you may answer a bit later, but at least you won't get shaken. Because your answer will be strong because you understand the basics behind it. Okay. Anyone can tell me. So, so if you get me for exam, you I can assure you I will ask about pathophysiology. I will ask, ask about pathophysiology. Okay, anyone can tell me the pathophysiology of nephrotic syndrome. You all should be better than me lah. Sebab baru habis second year first year kan. Anyone can tell me what is the pathophysiology of nephrotic syndrome? What is nephrotic syndrome? Uh, triad of proteinuria. Okay. Um, proteinuria, hypertension, and also edema. Salah lah tu. Proteinuria, okay. Proteinuria betul dah. Proteinuria, uh, edema. Okay, generalized edema. General. Anasarka, generalized edema. So, massive proteinuria. Bukan just biasa-biasa punya, bukan calang-calang punya proteinuria. Massive proteinuria. Generalized edema or anasarka. Lagi? 
uh, hyperlipidemia. Hyperlipidemia? Lagi? Uh, hypertension. No. No. Hypoalbuminemia. <clears throat> okay, so there are the four four component. The first one is massive proteinuria. Second is hypoalbuminemia. Third is generalized edema. And fourth is hyperlipidemia. So the four. Again, pediatric protocol for uh, Malaysian uh, pediatric protocol for Malaysian hospital fourth edition. Okay, you you need to know a bit of the numbers lah. So kalau massive proteinuria ni berapa? More than 3.5 gram per 24 hours. Okay, or or urine protein creatinine ratio for more than two. Or or twenty four hour urine more than forty milligram. Forty milligram per meter square. Hmm. Then so. You need you need to have an idea. Fifth year, fifth year, I think we expect you to remember these numbers. Yeah. So know the number. You need this calories, but you need that kind of basis, right? So massive proteinuria. Second is hypoalbuminemia of less than. You uh, serum albumin of less than. Two point five gram per deciliter. Twenty five gram per deciliter. Okay. The past two generalized edema. Dengan hyperlipidemia. Hyperlipidemia. Okay. So what is the pathophysiology? May anyone boleh try nak, nak try nak describe? Afiq, Afiq. Afiq Azmi. Hmm. So what? Try to, try to describe uh, pathophysiology of nephrotic syndrome. Uh, can you hear? Can. Okay. Uh, first, due to massive proteinuria, leads to hypoalbuminemia, and then it will cause reduce uh, oncotic pressure in the intravascular. So it cause the fluid to shift to the extravascular, and this uh, will activate the uh, the RAS system to act. Uh, Cause salt and water retention, which uh, which cause generalized edema or as anasaka, and leads to continue continued salt and water intake, and this loops will, uh, will cause again. Okay, all right. Okay, macam ni. Firstly, is you need to understand nephrotic syndrome. There are two. There are the primary and secondary nephrotic syndrome. So primary nephrotic syndrome ni mainly is Minimal change. So minimal change account to 80 to 90% of nephrotic syndrome is actually minimal change. Kenapa kita panggil minimal change is because when you do uh, electro when you do histology, it will be normal. You can only see abnormality when you do electron microscopy. Okay. So this is minimal change. And other daripada tu, dia ada, you had a focal segmental glomerular sclerosis or the membranous glomerulonephritis. So these are part of the primary nephrotic syndrome. You have the secondary nephrotic syndrome. Secondary nephrotic syndrome ni can be because of viral, such as hepatitis B, HIV. Uh, it can be because of uh, it can be because of food, such as jering, eh? jengkol, jengkol nephropathy. It can be because of post trip GN. It can be because of uh, 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 Hinoxonine purpura, it can be because of IgA nephropathy, it can be because of so many other things, it can be because of uh, heavy metals, it can be because of many other many other things, it can be because of genetics, uh, macam Alport syndrome, so these are all secondary nephrotic syndrome. So primary nephrotic syndrome is minimal change, which is uh, 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 which is which account for eighty to ninety percent of nephrotic syndrome. So what happens in nephrotic syndrome is that there is the effect there is inflammation, inflammatory process occurring at the at the glomerulus, at the glomerular basement membrane. So there's inflammatory process occurring at the glomerular basement membrane, which affects especially the podocytes and its food processes. 
So that is podocyte food processes effacement. Effacement of the podocyte food processes. Podocyte the glomerulus ni dia ada lubang 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 lubang. lubang. Okay, uh, let me try and draw. Okay, I don't have my uh, digital thingy here. Okay, so for example, eh, so this is the afferent arteriole. It goes into the glomerulus and then it comes out as your efferent arteriole. Balam ni macam macam lah eh. So this is Efferent, efferent arteriole. This is your efferent arteriole. This is your glomerulus. And lepas glomerulus ni is your apa ni? Benda apa ni? What is this? Bowman capsule. Bowman capsule. Yes. Bowman capsule. Di mana Bowman capsule? It goes into your uh, proximal convoluting tubule. Then it goes into your, apa ni lukisan ni memang buruk lah eh. Tapi I don't care. Susah nak draw dengan benda ni. So loop of Henley. And then your distal convoluting tubule. Ay, susah untuk lukis sikit. Alright. And then your collecting duct. <coughs> so this is the glomerulus. This is your Bowman's capsule. If you ambil sini, you akan nampak dia ada this surface. Lepas tu dia ada podocyte. Podocyte pula dia ada food processes dia. Ah, macam tu dah lebih kurang kan. So dekat dekat GBM ni dia ada dia punya lubang-lubang-lubang dia. Ada macam filter. Dia ada macam filter. So, sel dia macam tu kan. Sel dia macam tu. Sel dia macam tu. Kan. Dia ada lubang. Sel dia macam tu. Sel sel of the uh, glomerular basement membrane tu. Dan ni semua ni dia dipegang oleh the podocyte and dia punya food processes dia. Uh, food processes dia. Macam tu lebih kurang lah eh. Macam lebih kurang uduh. Kalau ada pen senang sikit nak draw. Kan. So, what happens is there is effacement of the podocyte food processes ni. Bila effacement tu, lubang dia jadi lagi besar. Lubang ni jadi lagi besar. So usually the 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 the, the filter is small. The channels are small. So this is a type of a channelopathy where the channels now become bigger. Why? Because of the effacement of the podocyte food processes. Sebelum ni, partikel besar macam albumin. It cannot pass through sebab lubang ni kecil. Now because of effacement of the food uh, podocyte food processes the the lumen the the, the channel become bigger bila dia become bigger bigger molecule macam blood bigger molecule macam uh, macam RBC macam uh, albumin boleh pass through tu satu yang kedua juga adalah this podocyte food processes are negatively charged negatively charged So bila dia negatively charge, albumin pun memang negatively charge. So bila dia negatively charge, dia repel. So albumin cannot pass through from the glomerular basement membrane nak masuk sampai ke uh, Bowman's capsule yang keluar apa semua. Sebab apa? Sebab dia both are negatively charged. So what happens because of this inflammation, the pod podocyte food processes ni dia jadi less negative. Kalau dia jadi positif, albumin melekat kat situ. Dah susah nak lepas. Tapi what happens is it becomes less negative. So bila dia become less negative, it's easier for a negatively charged particle to pass through. Sebelum ni dia negatively charged, so dia repel. Sekarang dia become less negative, so dia boleh easy to pass through. So these are the two mechanism yang jadi. Eh. Satu, effacement of the porosite food processes. Second is the change of ionicity of the Uh, of the porosite food processes as well. So the, from negatively charged, it becomes less negative. So albumin can pass through. So the result is a massive proteinuria. Massive proteinuria. That is massive albumin uh, uh, excreted through the urine. So massive proteinuria results in a 
hypoalbuminemia. So serum protein akan jadi akan jadi low. So bila serum protein jadi low, <coughs> what happen? Bila serum protein jadi low, there is a change in the stalling process. Remember stalling process. So stalling process are the plasma oncotic pressure, plasma hydrostatic pressure and uh, uh, interstitial punya uh, oncotic and hydrostatic pressure. So hypoalbuminemia affects your stalling process. It reduces the plasma oncotic pressure and increases relatively the plasma hydrostatic pressure. So because of this effect in the uh, stalling forces, it causes a fluid shift from intravascular into the extravascular space. Faham? So reduce plasma oncotic, relative increase in the uh, hydrostatic pressure. So fluid shift from the intravascular pergi kepada extravascular. So this is what we call, there are two theory about nephrotic. This is what we call as the underfield theory. This is the classical theory of nephrotic syndrome where there is underfill. So fluid shift from intravascular into the extravascular and causing activation of the RAAS, renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And also activation of your uh, 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 vasopressin and so on and so forth. It causes more water retention. And so and then more fluid shifted to the uh, it, from intravascular to extravascular, there's a third space loss of, of water. What happened to your intravascular volume? Your intravascular volume is underfilled. It is underfilled. It is depleted. So what happens to your blood pressure? Blood pressure may reduce. Sebab apa? Sebab there is under volume. So this is very important for you to understand the potential because you will get with the management. How do we manage later on? So this is the classical theory or the underfilled theory. There is another theory with nephrotic syndrome which is the overfill theory. So the overfill theory is that there is more activation of the RAAS, renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And also there is an activation of vasopressin, uh, antidiuretic hormones, so all this causes water retention and salt retention, and the num the the volume the 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 salt and water retention is more than the rate of fluid shift from intravascular into extravascular space. So what happens here? What happens here is overfill, overfill. There is some degree of oliguria as well. So this is overfill. So when there is overfill, your blood pressure may be high. Your blood pressure may be high. So kenapa important? Important je satu, how do you how do we treat uh, nephrotic syndrome later on? So basically we treat with steroid because as I've mentioned before, the problem is there's inflammatory process occurring at the GBM. So you know steroid acts at many levels. Steroid acts at the cellular level. Steroid acts at your tissue level. Steroid at, uh, acts at your uh, organ level. So steroid acts at multiple level. Okay. So steroid actually reduces all the changes that has happened. So we give steroid. You need to know lah the uh, how much steroid kita bagi apa semua. And 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 for nephrotic syndrome, you can remember eh, some definition. How do we define uh, remission? What is remission? How do we define relapse? What is the definition of relapse? Berapa banyak, berapa hari uh, urine uh, uh, protein, berapa plus? You need to know the definition of steroid sensitive. You need to know the definition of steroid dependent. Uh, you need to know the de definition of uh, steroid toxicity. You need to know the definition of uh, uh, apa nama, uh, uh, so there's several definition. Frequent relapse, for example. So. Then you need to know about steroid toxicity. Uh, steroid toxicity is another very important aspect in many diseases ada benda ni. So what are the uh, steroid toxicity? Cushing goit features. So kena tahulah. Okay. Alright. So satu kita bagi treatment dia is steroid. Uh, Pregnisolone. Kan? Lepas tu kita bagi apa? Sometimes you may consider albumin. And now you need to think. Adakah patient ni falls into the underfill or overfill theory? 
So bila you bagi albumin, what will happen? Fluid will be shifted from from extracellular from 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 extravascular back into the intravascular volume back into the intravascular space. So kalau you are in overfill theory, what will happen? Dia dah already overfill. Dia dah already fluid overloaded. Kan? You you tarik pula fluid daripada extravascular masuk dalam intravascular. Kan? BP akan lagi problem. So in this case you need to give furosemide. So you bagi albumin you bagi furosemide juga. Tapi kalau patient ni is underfill. Kalau you bagi furosemide, what's going to happen? BP akan crash sebab dia already underfill. Faham tak? Dia dah already intravascular volume dah depleted. Kalau you bagi furosemide, you bagi diuretics, dia akan lagi you akan lose more Uh, fluid. You can lose more fluid. Uh, so that is why understanding pathophysiology is very important. Bila you understand the pathophysiology, then you know how to manage the patient. You know how to manage the patient. Okay. <coughs> Let's go to AGN. And then we'll, 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 we'll go through uh, uh, side by side. Okay. Uh, how about AGN? What is the pathophysiology of AGN? Akmal. the physiology of EDN <coughs> Hello Yeah yeah yes Wait um yeah, my my connection something wrong with my connection <coughs> Uh for acute glomerulonephritis Um, so uh, the first thing that happened in AGM is um, <coughs> um, there is um, activation of no no it start from the deposition of antibody okay by cell mediated uh, immune immune uh, immune mechanism okay and because of that it cause activation of resident cells and lead to change in matrix of uh, the uh, the glomerulus and wait lah uh. okay, google tak google wait wait uh. okay macam ni so basically in AGN you need to remember most of them is actually post streptococcus so there is a prior infection with Group A beta hemolytic streptococcus, such as streptococcus pyogenes. So this group A beta hemolytic streptococcus, they have the ability of what we call as molecular mimicry. So where they mimic certain certain organs that we have, certain tissues that we have. Generally, they are cardiogenic strain or nephritogenic strain. So those cardiogenic strain beta hemolytic uh, group A beta hemolytic streptococcus are those that may cause uh, rheumatic carditis. And the other part is the nephritogenic strain. So this nephritogenic strain is the one that causes uh, AGM, acute glomerulonephritis. nephritis. So there is a prior infection with group A beta hemolytic streptococcus, such as upper respiratory infection, pharyngitis, tonsillitis, sore throat, eh? And or can can also be skin infection because streptococcus is a normal common cell on your skin. If it gets into the skin, it can cause infection such as impetigo. And so there is a infection with group A beta hemolytic streptococcus. And what happens when there is infection is our body will fight that infection. So our body will produce antibody against it. So this antibody and then will bind to the Uh, to the to 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 the uh, to the bacteria kan and it will form antibody complex so and then because of it is nephritogenic there will be antibody complex deposition and where will it deposit in deposits at your kidney and your kidney basic specifically your glomerulus so there will be antibody complex deposition at your glomerular basement membrane 
so causes all inflammatory process all inflammatory reaction it will damage your glomerular basement membrane so it affects it reduces the glomerular filtration rate your gfr will be affected in nephrotic syndrome gfr is not affected kidney can still uh, uh, as excrete uh, water as normal but in nef in agn your gfr will be affected because of the damage of the inflammation occurring at your gbm so there will be inflammatory reaction and uh, 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 affect a reduction in your gfr so reduction in gfr causes apa reduction in gfr causes oliguria and also because of this they it affects activation of raas as well so renin angiotensin system is activated as well so causes more salt and water retention and so there will be oliguria so oliguria will result in fluid overload fluid overload so it results in hypertension there will be renal failure why renal failure because of the destruction of your gbm then so there will be gfr will be affected fluid overload causing hypertension renal failure there will also be hematuria why because of the inflammatory process occurring at the glomerulus and also your tubules as well so you will have hematuria and then because of fluid overloaded hypertension you may have some edema but the edema is not as severe as nephrotic syndrome sebab apa because the problem is not your stalling forces sangat it's just because of the fluid retention because of the fluid fluid retention so this is the pathophysiology of of agn so if you understand the pathophysiology what how would you treat agn How would you treat AGN? If you have a child presenting with AGN, so they can have what? They can have periorbital puffiness, ankle edema, kan? They have oliguria, kan? They have hematuria. So what will you do? How how would you manage? We restrict the fluid. Okay, so fluid restriction. How much will we restrict? How much would we restrict? Up to 400 milliliter per day. So 400 mils per meter squared per day. Mana kita dapat value 400 mils per meter squared per day ni? What value is this? Four hundred mils per meter squared per day is the insensible loss. So the amount of fluid that we will lose from respiration from sweating yeah, from our saliva these are uh, amount of fluid that we will lose whatever we do we will lose around 400 mils per meter square per day so fluid restriction of 400 mils per meter square per day and then apa lagi and then kita strict input output chart sebab kita nak tengok dia ada oliguria kan so strict input output chart lepas tu apa lagi lepas tu kita try to reduce salt so no added salt or uh, less salt punya diet kan lagi apa lagi? Lagi, would you give antibiotic tak? Nak bagi antibiotic tak? Hmm, yes, nak. Okay, if you look at PIP protocol, is they still kata bagi antibiotic. Tapi if you understand the pathophysiology, the AGN is not caused directly by the infection. It is actually caused by the antibody complex deposition. Usually by that by the, by the time it deposited, uh, bacteria tu dah tak ada dah. Uh, so pathophysiology you don't actually need, but you do think because we don't know whether you have cleared out the uh, the uh, the infection clearly or not. So sometimes we do give, but in theory you don't actually need antibiotic. Okay, what else? What else can you give? Antihypertensive. Okay, before you give antibiotic, you know the problem is oliguria. So there is reduction in urine output. So you can consider giving 
Diuretics. What type of diuretics that you know? Ni fikir punya question lah sebenarnya. Furosemide. Oh, furosemide, which is a type of, dia, what type of diuretic? Loop diuretic. Loop diuretic. Furosemide, which is a loop diuretic. Or you can give potassium sparing. Eh? Apa contoh potassium sparing? Spironolactone. Spironolactone. Or you can give thiazide diuretic kan. So you can consider giving diuretic because you know already the pathophysiology is oliguria, impaired GFR. <coughs> yeah, then you can consider giving antihypertensive. A, a, any type of antihypertensive that you know that you can give. Uh, simvastatin. Simvastatin. Simvastatin is not antihypertensive. Statin, statin are all uh, lipid yeah, medication. Tesen inhibitors. Tenidopril. Okay, so kita start by group lah. Okay, firstly is, okay, tadi sebut pril kan. So you can give uh, captopril or perindopril. Yang pripripril ni are ACE inhibitor. Angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. Kan? You can give ACE inhibitor. Apa lagi yang you boleh bagi? Receptor blocker, agendasi receptor blocker. ARBs, so okay. Apa contoh ARBs? Losartan. Ah, setan-setan punya gang tu kan? So, uh, semua uh, setan-setan punya gang ni, dia gang-gang uh, ARBs. Apa lagi? Calcium channel blocker. Huh? Calcium channel blocker. Calcium channel blocker, such as? Nifedipine. Nifedipine, amlodipine. So yang pin 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 ni dan jangan calcium channel blocker. Apa lagi? Yang non yang non dihydrofiridin verapamil boleh. Um, jarang jarang lagi guna tu jauh lagi. So you can give beta blockers. Beta blockers ni yang geng lol 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 belakang tu, metoprolol, propanolol, lol lol lol, lol ni beta blockers. You can also give you dah kata calcium channel blocker, beta blockers, you can also give alpha blockers. Macam prazosin, eh? those alpha blockers. So these are things that you can, you can give. So this is how you manage eh? uh, uh, EGN. Okay, clear. So the difference is in nephrotic syndrome, GFR is not affected. It is just becoming more porous. More porous to albumin. And it affects the stalling forces and so on and so forth. Tapi in A, in AGN, nephrotic GFR not affected. AGN GFR affected. So this is why in AGN you boleh consider those things. You can consider uh, uh, diuretics and so on and so forth. Fluid restriction. In nephrotic syndrome, you do not do fluid restriction. What will happen kalau you fluid restrict nephrotic syndrome? Nephrotic syndrome, kalau you fluid restrict, you kata, oh alamak, budak ini nampak edematous gila-gila, sakit saya apa semua. So let's restrict fluid. What will happen? Dehydration. Yes, because dia nampak macam edema, tapi it is just extravascular. Intravascular, it is actually underfill. Intravascular, it is depleted. So if you fluid restrict, you will kill the child. You will kill the child. So that is why, you need to understand the pathophysiology. Hmm. When you understand the pathophysiology, you know what are the questions that you, you need to ask. You know what are the physical examination. You know what are the things that, uh, how you going to manage and so on and so forth. Okay. All right. Cukup. Satu jam. Online class ni is a bit tiring sebenarnya kalau lama-lama. Kalau nak, kita boleh arrange other session. Tak apalah. Nanti bila face-to-face, -face, we'll, we'll, we'll conduct some other question as well. Okay, any other question before we stop? Ada? Tak ada? Faham belaka semua? Clear? Doktor, saya ada soalan. Yep. Macam mana nak jadi hebat macam doktor? Eh, tak ada. I'm not good at all. 
the thing is the thing is it's just getting the basics is very important i think getting the basics is very important okay all right boleh lah eh Doctor, uh, can I ask a question regarding asthma? Ah yes. Ah, uh, yang untuk asthma tu kan ada day symptoms dengan nocturnal symptoms. Yep. Ah, uh, symptoms tu refer to the wheezing, coughing, breathlessness, chest tightness tu. Ke? Yes. So certain certain asthmatic patient they present with mainly cough. Tak banyak wheezing pun, mainly cough. Certain asthmatic patient they present with mainly wheezing. So you look at what are the uh, some patient they don't have cough, they don't have wheezing, they have breathlessness. So those are types of symptoms that 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 can happen. So you look at what are the symptoms that is predominant uh, for the patient. There, there's another. Uh, It's quite good. Uh, okay, again, as I said before, the basic for you to read is actually the pediatric protocol for Malaysian Hospital. Now it's fourth edition. Okay, another good read is the uh, Malaysian CPG for childhood asthma. Uh, if you look at the Malaysian CPG for childhood asthma, yeah, tapi ni yang lama punya version. Uh, I think they are trying to publish a new one this year. I think later this year lah, ataupun next year baru akan keluar. So there's another uh, CPG that 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 uh, so you kalau you buka CPG lama tu dia akan list down few uh, phenotypes of asthma asthma phenotypes uh, macam contohnya childhood wheeze uh, childhood asthma uh, brittle asthma uh, uh, multi trigger wheeze episodic wheeze viral induced wheeze kan so dia ada dia ada dia ada banyak group yang lebih kurang sama presentation dengan dengan asthma So that those are interesting for me. That's interesting as well, lah. Boleh uh, try, boleh try baca. Uh, I have them. Kalau nak, you just remind me, then I can I can share it to you. Huh? So copy it. Yeah. Uh, kalau you buka uh, Academy of Medicine Malaysia pun from that website, you can download lah the uh, CPG for childhood asthma. So the other um, how to manage and how to understand which type of the asthma phenotype that the child actually has. Uh, so sometimes tu lah, sometimes certain they just present with cough, certain they present with breathlessness, certain they present with wheezing. Okay, alright, boleh, boleh. Eh? Okay, uh, let's end our session with uh, Tasbih Kafarah and Surah Tulas. Assalamualaikum. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you so much, Doctor. <laughs>